And what I'm telling you about today is uh, a new platform uh, that we called Functional Intravital Imaging that combines the basics of intravital imaging. So basically, you are able to look inside a mouse to investigate um, cellular processes that happen there. But we have a twist. So the intravital imaging I'm talking to you about is functional. So on top of seeing how cells move around, we are also able to observe cellular processes that happen within the cell in real time in the live animal. I will um, tell you about um, our efforts to apply that to scientific questions that are essentially connected to the immune, to the study of the immune response to tumors. And the seminar is outlined more or less like this. A few slides, even if pretty dense, uh, explaining you the basics of functional intravital imaging. And then a huge chunk here, the blue one, um, in which I will be telling you about the published work, uh, but it is very complete, that exemplifies how functional intravital imaging can be used to study the dynamics of a specific signaling pathway, the NFAT1, in T cells during their fight against cancer. And the last uh, chunk um, is about a very, very new project that I am trying to develop now, which is basically analyzing the activation, again through NFAT sensors, of regulatory T cells, again, when they establish the immune uh, tolerance to tumors. All right, oh, sorry. Let's start from the general focus of, of the laboratory I am in. So we are particularly interested in analyzing the interactions between antigen-presenting cells and T cells that, as you know, govern their the T cell ontogeny, their priming in secondary lymphoid organs, and also their function in uh, peripheral organs. And especially today, I will tell you about a specific type of peripheral tissue, which is the tumor tissue. And our favorite approach is multiphoton intravital microscopy, whose pipeline is just briefly um, uh, reported here. So the first thing that we have to do is to create an environment in vivo that is amenable to visualization. So typically, what we do is to transfer cells that are labeled with genetic present proteins, essentially. And in this example pipeline, for example, we could inject a tumor cell line that is labeled in blue through the protein cerulean. Seven days later, we can come with GFP-positive T cells. And starting from a couple of days later, we can start our intravital microscopy. But before um, starting the uh, in vivo recordings, we have to microsurgically prepare the mice to expose the organ of interest. And we have um, several techniques set up in the lab, but what is important for us today is just two of them. One is exposing and visualizing the popliteal lymph node. The other, why, the, the other one is um, exposing the dermis of the skin through a metal frame that is called dorsal skinfold chamber uh, that creates an optically clear window. So basically, you can image the skin from the inside, from the dermis. And of course, you can also implant tumors in the dermis that way and observe tumors as they develop. The third step is to basically take the mouse, anesthetized, of course, and put under the scope to acquire movies. So now, the, the important thing about this is the type of the scope. We have a multi-photon uh, microscope that is superior to other systems for intravital imaging, because, such as the confocal, for, for instance, because it minimizes uh, photo bleaching and phototoxicity and also ensures a deeper tissue penetration. Last but definitely not least, we have to crunch all the imaging data to quantify them. And let me tell you, uh, this is the most time consuming part, easily taking up as much time as the, all the other three put together. This is just an example of 
how multi-photon microscopy can work. So we can visualize immune immunity in context. This is a tumor in a dorsal skin front chamber. You can see just the blue nuclei because the tumor has been stably transduced with a fusion of histone 2B and the blue fluorescent protein cerulean. Other structures that fluorescent blue are these very faint fibrils <coughs> here that are basically collagen fibers that light up because of second harmonic generation. Another structure that we can very easily um, highlight is blood vessel. Here, all, all you have to do is basically to inject the mice with quantum dots and they, the blood vessels that miraculously light up. And the third component is of course the T cells that invade the tumor that in this case are just labeled by plain GFP. We will see in a second that this plain labeling of T cells is not our favorite approach. Anyways, when you play a movie, you can easily see how dynamic T cells are while they fight cancer. So an important thing that I didn't tell you is that these T cells are actually expressing TCR recognizing uh, a tumor associated gene. So basically, they will get activated when they see their cognate antigen. But the first thing that you can probably uh, note is that the dynamic behavior of T cells is extremely different depending on the area of the cancer. Um, if you just focus your attention on, on this very distal area, the T cells are freely roaming around. No problem. But if you now give a look at this area closer to the tumor, actually you have predominance of arrested T cells. Now the question, the important question is, what kind of signals are the cells receiving here? And to answer to that question, we have to add one dimension to our analysis. So we have to, to get functional, to have uh, um, a handle on, uh, on the functional pathways that are elicited in this in this case. And to do so, we have to replace the GFP with something a little bit more elaborate, which is a reporter of cellular processes um, that, again, usually it is uh, based on uh, fusions between fluorescent proteins and regulatory domain of signaling proteins. And now, if we just think a little bit about the ideal reporter is one that changes color once the, upon the uh, triggering the signaling pathway, or in some instances, actually very frequently, we can also measure the change of subcellular localization in these reporters. This reporter should not interfere with cell physiology. It should have a geometry that is amenable for quantification, and uh, you'll see uh, an example of that in one second and should have a high dynamic range of, if you prefer, a very favorable uh, signal-to-noise ratio. There are several classes of such reporters. The first class I'll briefly discuss about is the color changers, so reporters that simply change color. This is usually based on FRET, and the idea is to put a FRET couple together through a domain that is sensitive to cellular processes happening into the cell. For example, apoptosis, why not? And in this case, if you have a DVD bridge linking CFP and YFP, and you also have active caspase 3, what you find is, at the end of the day, is that this bond is cleaved, and the threat signal from the CFP to YFP is completely lost. And um, developing, I mean, exploiting this uh, principle, uh, many sense of, of calcium, for example, or also for some signaling pathways such ERK and PKA have been developed. Um, there is the possibility that this domain sequesters the proteins uh, out of their uh, physiological function, so it is always important to understand or to make sure that our construct is not interfering with the cell physiology again. The, the geometry is totally amenable to quantification because you just have the whole cell that is either blue or yellow. And the, the high dynamic range is actually unfortunately not usually present. Um, this is actually the big problem uh, of, of this class 
of, of reporters. So other classes are, are, have also been developed. One of them is what I, uh, I call the cytoplasm to membrane shuttlers. So basically, these reporters are fusions of uh, signaling domains of, sig sorry, regulatory domains of signaling protein and the GFP, or amylofluorescent protein, that change localization from the whole cell to a specific area of the plasma membrane, um, which can be for T cells, for example, the immunological synapse, upon triggering of, of the relevant signaling pathway. Um, the problem with such reporters is that the quantification is hell. Why it is so difficult? It is difficult because their geometry is difficult. What I mean is that you have just a modest accumulation of fluorescent, fluorescence in a particular area of the plasma membrane that can vary from cell to cell, and in the worst case scenario, can, happens on, can happen on the z-axis where your resolution is basically horrible. So uh, it is absolutely complex to quantify that. And usually the dynamic range is not so much because, again, the accumulation of the plasma membrane is far from being complete. Third class, my favorite one, of course, is the shuttlers that move from the cytoplasm to the nucleus. And NFAT is basically the, the first one to have been developed, probably. Um, th these shuttlers are great because um, in unstimulated cells, they are confined to the cytoplasm, but upon stimulation, all of the protein suddenly migrates into the nucleus. And uh, um, they, anyways, pose a little bit of a problem because usually these molecules have a direct effect on transcription, so you have to make sure that you don't screw up transcription. But anyways, they have two very favorable um, assets that are that the geometry is easy here because it is just a symmetrical geometry. It is pretty easy to quantify nuclear translocations. And the other thing is that the high dynamic range, although variable, for some of them is fantastic. For example, for an FAT, which is completely excluded from the nucleus in non-signaling cell, a completely nuclear in signaling cells. So easy to, for, for us to understand that we chose an FAT reporter as the first one to go with. In T cells, that's not super clear, but anyways, in T cells, the NFAT pathway is, of course, elicited by stimulation through the T cell receptor. Coming from outside, you know, the cell here, you have the um, encounter between the T cell receptor and the peptide NHC, the cognate peptide NHC, which basically uh, causes an earthquake within a cell. Many signaling pathways are elicited. We are just interested in the one going from PLC gamma, IP3, and uh, the stem and the crack channels that causes a surge of uh, calcium ions coming from outside the cell to within the cell um, that has plenty of biological effects. Today, we are just interested in two of them. One is that cells with high calcium stop moving, simply. This is called migratory stop signal. And the other effect is that calcium activated calcineurin, which is a phosphatase that, among other functions, is able to dephosphorylate cytoplasmic NFAT, uh, expose a nuclear localization sequence, so that NFAT can go to the nucleus and start transcribing genes. Um, this is how the reporter was designed by Jose Aramburu in Anjana Rao's lab 15 years ago already. And um, basically, J Jose just got the end terminal regulatory domain of NFAT1 and fused it to the GFP, truncating completely or almost completely the DNA binding domain. This is the, the strategy he used to make sure that this reporter is not interfering with the endogenous NFAT, at least the transcriptional activity of it. We cloned it in retroviral vectors. And we developed a protocol to infect uh, hemagglutinin-specific CD8 T cells in vitro that 
will be used for adoptive transfers or for in vitro, in vitro assays by day seven. And this is how uh, the transduction looks like. So in a non-stimulated T cell, you have a perfectly ex nuclear excluded NFAT GFT. Uh, what I didn't, sorry, tell you is that we also transduce the cells with a nuclear counter stain that in this case is a fusion of histone 2D with RFP. And this is the merged image. If you just stimulate these T cells with the Cognac peptide, of course, passed on antigen presenting cell, what you get is the complete nuclear translocation of MFAP, which in this case perfectly co localizes with the H2B RFP. So before going in vivo, we just needed one more piece of software. Uh, what we need to do is to have a way of unbiasedly quantify nuclear translocation uh, on uh, several thousand cells. And uh, also what we need is an algorithm that far from being perfect is fast enough not to spend all our days in looking at computers spitting out data, essentially. And we devised something like that. This is actually something that we developed in the, in the laboratory. So this is a scheme of a non-signaling cell with NFAT nicely cytoplasmic and the red nucleus. So we can easily define the nuclear center. Then we can draw concentric circles stemming from the nuclear center and calculate the average intensity of fluorescence for the red and the green channel along the radius, essentially, which is plotted here. So the uh, red signal, of course, peaks immediately and then fades out. And in, uh, in uh, a non-signaling cell, the green signal now starts low, becomes, uh, has a peak here corresponding to the cytoplasm clearly, and then fades out. You can clearly imagine that the situation in a signaling cell is completely different, and the red and the green curve now are completely overlapping. So we define this minimal intersection of the red and the green curve as a signaling index of zero, while this perfect overlap as a signaling of one. All right, that was the end of the introduction. Now, the real deal, the data. Uh, so the first system, the first biological question we asked um, and we tried to answer to by functional and intravital imaging is how are T cells activated? How is an FAT activated? during stable contacts with an antigen presenting cell, as opposed to another model, which is serial contacts with several ant antigen presenting cells. Actually, I mean, from textbook, from my college um, studies, I also always believed that the uh, main way of interaction for T cells was the stable one. This is a vision that has been challenged recently since the um, serial interaction model has been clearly demonstrated in initial and late phases of antigenic priming, for example, but not only there, also during tolerance induction by several different means, and also in tumor tissues. So the question is now, how are T-cell activated dur during this initial stable phases? And most importantly, how are T-cell activated during the intervening period from one contact to the subsequent one? All right, so it is time to go in vivo, finally. And the first uh, question we asked is how uh, fast is an FAT signaling occurring? So uh, we used this experimental scheme. We generated uh, HA-specific HA -specific, um, CD8 cells transduced with an FAT GFP and also the nuclear counter stain. Uh, differentiating them into T central memory so that they can home to the lymph node easily. After a couple of days in which the T cells parked to the node, we came up with an injection of antigen presenting cells, which is in this case just simple B cells that have been or have been not passed with the cognate peptide. We prepared the lymph node for, for imaging and acquire movies. And what you get at the end of the day is this. The lymph node capsule is here on the right, uh, highlighted by a uh, second harmonic generation of collagen fibers. Deep into the parenchyma here, you can clearly see the T cells 
uh, transduced with the NFAT and the nuclear counter stain, and two population of B cells. The white ones are just controls. There is nothing passed to them. The blue ones have been passed with a cognate antigen for the T cells. Upon playing the movie, you can see that the T cells are free to roam around. They actually are very motile. And if you have good eyes, you can see interactions uh, of T cells with exclusively blue B cells. If you don't have so good eyes, don't worry too much because I have blow ups. And um, so this is a non-activated T cell that is going to make a decision. So whether to interact with a white or with a blue, blue B cell. You can, of course, imagine that it will interact with the blue, but the interesting thing is to look on how fast an FAT goes in. And the answer is almost immediately. And the interaction is persistent. During the whole interaction, the, the T cell keeps an FAT activated, but then what happens when the interaction ceases? Again, we were puzzled to, to see that apparently an FAT resides in the nucleus for a little bit longer. It takes more time for it to come back, to go back to the cytoplasm than from the cytoplasm to accumulate to the nucleus. Of course, we like numbers, and by averaging many, many of these events, you come up with this. Upon the, 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 sorry, the kinetics of nuclear translocation are extremely fast. Time zero is, of course, the interaction, the, the, the onset of interaction. And after uh, three minutes, everything is complete. And the key half of the process is just one minute. The other way around, so the cytoplasmic relocation after, after the uh, cessation of contact occurs much more slowly with a T half of 20 minutes. We run the lot, lot of controls to understand that this slow interaction is actually an intrinsic ability of an FAT proteins. It is not due to um, persisting calcium signaling to the cell. Actually, the calcium drops immediately. What you get is that NFAT, because of its nature, is slow getting out of the nucleus. Well, now the beautiful question is, during this deactivation of NFAT, is it transcriptionally competent? And the answer is, oh, I don't tell you. I just tell you the experiment. So to, um, uh, to understand that, we went back in vitro and did a little bit of a complicated setup. So we set out to quantify a typical NFAT-dependent gene, which is interferon gamma, in T cells that have been subjected to a period of pre-stimulation and a, a subsequent period of what we call measurement time, in which an interferon gamma is allowed to accumulate within the cells. So this white condition here is just a blank, no stimulation, nothing happening during the um, measurement phase. Here, the second line, we have pre-stimulation for 30 minutes with PMA and anionomycin, and then we abruptly block transcription by adding actinomycin D. And what you get is a little bit of interferon gamma, which is, of course, due to the translation of the transcripts that accumulated here during the um, pre-stimulation phase. Indeed, when we blocked translation through cyclohexamide, this level of interferon gamma went back to zero. Now we played with actinomycin D. We added it at several time points along the um, measurement phase to create a sort of standard curve of transcription, so to speak. And finally, the real experiment, just one well, um, which is what happens when I block an FAT completely through cyclosporin A. And to our surprise, we found that interferon gamma is transcribed, uh, transcribed above background, meaning that we have a sort of NFAT memory that basically is a functional ability of NFAT to transcribe genes during its deactivation. And again, this led us to a pretty intriguing hypothesis. The most intriguing uh, thing of this hypothesis is that it is verifiable. But the fact is, 
Can you imagine a first contact of a T cell with an APC that, of course, drives NFAT to the nucleus with very fast kinetics? Then you can imagine a sort of period of um, an NFAT memory in which we have slow NFAT deactivation, yet you have transcriptional competence at least for 20 minutes. And then you have a second meeting with an antigen presenting cell. What is the cool thing here? It is that despite the TCR triggering is discontinuous, NFAT memory makes the, um, NFAT signal and transcription to be continuous. So it is a way for uh, TSAS to integrate this continuous intermittent signal into a continuous transcriptional response. And also the prediction is that we will observe a dissociation of an FAT activation and stop. So in, uh, in the good conditions, we may observe actively migrating cells that are nonetheless activated. How can we verify that? We went back in vivo. We now chose a tumor model in which antigen presentation is known to be horrible. And um, this actually uh, promotes the onset of serial contacts instead of stable contacts. Um, so the experiment is as follows. We put CT26 tumors expressing hemagglutinin into a skinfold chambers. After one week, we come uh, with uh, NFAT transduced uh, HA specific CTLs and then we just do movies from day two to day seven. And what you see is this. Again, you have a very nice tumor, a tumor parenchyma here. Again, you see only the nuclei. Um, this tumor is densely uh, vascularized and importantly, it is also densely infiltrated by T cells. And upon playing, you can see highlighted here in yellow that the vast majority of the cells actually are rather stopped while signaling. But you have exceptions. And the two exceptions here are highlighted in, in, uh, in red. Of a cell that is actively signaling, this one for example, and also actively moving. And the other one is popping up from here. Here we go. We can quantify that in a way that resembles fax plots. On the x-axis, you can put the instantaneous velocity of cells, and on the y-axis, the NFAT signaling index. In, uh, in a tumor that does not express HA, all the cells are moving like crazy, and none of them is activated. In a, uh, on the other hand, when the tumor expresses the cognate antigen, you, what you see is all the combinations. The expected ones are cells that move uh, no matter what, cells that get arrested though don't signal, they might just receive um, very few signal or may have physical constraints. You observe cells that are signaling yet arrested and finally you can observe cells that are signaling and moving. Which is basically a good step towards our, uh, our hypothesis. Yet there we had to rule out something um, before making strong conclusions. And what we have to rule out is that the behavior of these cells that signal and move is due to the fact that they may receive activatory signals on the run through the so-called immune kinapsis. To understand this a little bit better, um, we went back in, vi in vitro. Uh, this is basically just migration of T cell on ICAM coated surfaces. And without any kind of stimulation, the, the T cells uh, move around freely. But when you have tapsic arginine, which um, increases the calcium concentration, actually you have a massive calcium flux from outside to inside, you, you have um, a sudden stop of the cells and a massive signaling that is actually depicted here again in a plot of instantaneous velocity versus an FAT signaling index. Now the trick is how can we limit a little bit calcium flux in order to see whether the stop comes first or the NFAT activation comes first. There is a trick that you can do, pretty old one, 
and pretty crude one also, um, that is essentially to increase the concentration of potassium ions in the cult cultural medium. So by increasing potassium ions, you depolarize the membrane. And by doing so, calcium has problems getting into the cell. And this is actually a very nice plot dating back to 1994, stating clearly that there is an inverse relationship between the amount of you know, potassium ions you find, you put in the medium, and the amount of intracellular calcium that at the end of the day you find into the cells. So basically what we did is to pump potassium ions into our medium, apply our stimulus, and give a look whether it shows up a rest first or an FAT activation first. And the answer is pretty clear. Here, you see that there are many cells that are rested, some of them that um, signal through an FAT, but what you lack is cells that are signaling and moving. So this makes extremely unlikely that we have productive kinapsis in vivo, since the cells that get activated first arrest and then signal. Well, all is nice and good, but so why should cells be able to uh, activate an, F an FAT um, during stable contacts or uh, in, uh, during or using an FET memory, um, does it have, do, does this two modality of signaling have different meanings? And actually what we know from literature is that NFAT itself can, uh, can have uh, pretty distinct meanings based on the fact if it is alone signaling or has partners, namely AP1. If NFAT signals by itself, we have transcription of a set of genes that is linked to tolerance establishment. While if you have an FAT plus AP1, what you get is a transcription of a completely different <laughs> set of genes that basically leads to effective immunity. Interferon gamma is a clear example of this. So what we think happens, may happen, is that during the first stable contacts, you have activation on FAT and AP1. Then during FAT memory, AP1 may get rapidly inactivated. We know that it, this is absolutely true for ERK, for example, which is a crucial feeder of AP1 that has no memory at all. Uh, the signal completely fades out one minute after cessation of PCR trigger. Then, again, second contact, you have active NFAT and AP1. At the end of the day, you get continuous transcription of an FAT on the genes and an intermittent transcription of the genes that require an FAT plus AP1. To see whether we were right, we reloaded our memory time experiment in vitro, this time substituting PMA aeonomycin with concanavalin A, which is another compound in selectin that causes TCR triggering. The good thing of it is that it has um, a competitive sugar that basically if you add it into the cell, you com immediately lose TCR stimulation. This, it is this guy here called, called alpha methyl monoside. So the experiment is as follows. Again, we read out interferon gamma. This is the blank, has nothing. This is a condition in which we treated with actinomycin B from the beginning of the measurement phase, giving a little bit of interferon gamma. <coughs> And this little bit is again due to um, accumulation, sorry, of translation of uh, transcripts accumulated here in the pre-stimulation phase. Then we create this um, standard curve of transcription by adding actinomycin D at distinct time points. And then finally we do the experiment. That is, let's block an FAT. And again, you get a little bit of memory. Let's block the whole TCR. And what you get is nothing which is cool because we know that interferon gamma is one of these genes that depends on both an FAT and AP1. So now the question is, is this lack of memory when we truncate basically TCR signaling true for all the genes or the genes belonging to the other class, the NFAT only genes, do retain memory as we expect? This is actually what we verified. EGR2 is a key um, mediator of cell tolerance, it is an NFAT only gene, and retains memory even if you completely truncate TCR triggering. So this leads us to speculate 
that the NFAT memory phase here is important for a transcription of a specific set of genes, the genes that depend on FAT only, the genes that are involved in tolerance. And we, we try to characterize all this a little bit better by getting back in vivo in a system where, again, it is a tumor system, but a system where we destabilized even further the interaction between antigen-presenting cells and T cells. And we did so by a trick which is adding antigen-specific T regulatory cells, CD4, FOXP3, T regs. This is very well known to completely destabilize T APC contacts. Now the question is, do T cells operate preferentially in NFAT memory mode? And the answer is, they do. As you can clearly see here, of a fantastically roaming cell, and another example is there, that has an FAT concentrated to the nucleus. If you just quantify the whole thing, you find that it's distinct time points here, T regulatory cells do not modulate an FAT activation. What they modulate is the context in which an FAT is activated. Here, to demonstrate that, we basically gated our analysis on segments of cell tracks that uniformly signal, and then we asked how arrested are those cells. This is an arrest coefficient, which is one when the cell is completely stuck, and zero when the cell is completely moving. At day two, the addition of T-Rex doesn't do much, but day, by day five, what you get is that without T-Rex, you have stabilization of cells that are signaling. But in presence of T-Rex, you have destabilization of the cells that are signaling, and even more so by day seven. And this is basically a summary of the whole thing. Any hint of uh, differential expression of NFAT only versus NFAT plus AP1 genes in presence of T regulatory cells. Yes, we got it recently, just published in JCI. Again, it is our tumor system. Without T regs, you have plenty of interferon gamma and TNF produced by the T cells that invade the tumor. In presence of HA and T regulatory cells, you have much less interferon gamma and TNF. The opposite is true for a couple of genes that are NFAT only genes, PD1 and TIM3, whose expression is increased in presence of HA specific T regulatory cells. So let's get to our conclusions. The first important thing that we characterized is that the kinetics of NFAT are, the on kinetics are extremely fast, but the off kinetics are 20 times slower. And during this slow nuclear export, NFAT actually remains transcriptionally competent for a specific class of genes, not for all of them, but just for some of them. And those genes are tolerance-associated genes. And finally, we see that NFAT memory modality is favored under conditions of unstable TAPCs that are triggered by addition of T regulatory cells. And the model is more or less this one. We think that the stable T cell APC contacts are actually favoring immunity through uh, transcription on FAT plus AP1 genes. While when cells operate under um, NFAT memory, what you get is the preferential expression of tolerance-associated genes. This is the end of of everything <laughs> of my talk today. But I would leave you on, on, with an overview on what we can do by functional imaging right now and we, what we can probably do in the future, um, expanding the capabilities of such techniques. So right now, what we can do is to image the T cell activation and also the response to cytokines. And we can also image apoptosis. Much more is to come. Uh, in the near future, actually, we are working on imaging two pathways at the same time. And the pathway will be, of course, NFAT, and the other one is ERK, as we suppose that ERK is the key regulator of AP1 that, uh, for example, should not be triggered during an FAT memory phase. We, can, we will be able to image lethal hit delivery or the granulation of CD8s and NK by, by using LAMP-GFP fusion. We can imagine in developing sensors 
to image signaling myeloid cells and in the stem cells, we can image transcription by simply um, cloning a fluorescent protein under the control of a promoter controlled by a specific transcription factor, such as the NFAT again. And finally, we can probably image cell differentiation <coughs> by using Mirna-sensitive fluorescent protein. I would just like to spend one second more on this latter thing because I think it would be extremely interesting and important. What we can do is, first of all, characterize the Mirna that are basically uh, differentially expressed according to the differentiation state uh, of, uh, of a cell lineage. You can image for imagine, for example, hematopoietic stem cells that change their Mirna profile as they differentiate. Then we can try cloning a lentiviral vector that encodes for a Mirna-regulated GFP and a control distinguishable of fluorescent proteins. This is the typical construct that Luigi Naldini likes to use in Milano. The, those are bidirectional promoters. Um, on one side of the cassette, you have expression of the GFP, and you have four tandem repeats of a mere target sequence. So that this GFP is, um, is expressed only if the MIRT is, sorry, the MIR is not expressed by the cell. Nonetheless, m cherry will be constitutively expressed. So, at the end of the day, in a cell that has the mirror, the color of that cell would be red. The, the, the cell that does not have the mirror, the color will be the sum of red and green. So, it will look yellow in you know, its scope. And we can use that uh, approach to monitor cell dynamics in vivo as a function of their differentiation stage, you can imagine, for example, to follow the migration and niche occupancy of hematopoietic cells as they differentiate. You can also, uh, I'm biased towards T-Rex, of course, but recently has been described that, that MIR-155 is downregulated in uh, effector T-Rex that are the T-regulatory cells that are responsible to establish immunological tolerance in peripheral tissues. By uh, such a construct, it will be uh, possible to distinguish ETREX versus central TREX in vivo and, and give a look, for example, investigate what is the differentiation determinants that uh, set the transition from CTREX to ETREX. It will be also possible to see uh, if they have different migration patterns, for example. Okay, so uh, that's all, and uh, <laughs> I tell the truth now. Um, I would like to thank my lab, and especially Torsten, here, my mentor and uh, young and extremely brilliant investigator. And, uh, but I have to say that all this is extremely time consuming and it would not be possible without the help of all of my friends here um, that are listed, especially uh, Thomas for the lymph node imaging and Teresa for all the in vitro part. And also this um, work has been funded by uh, some grants to my boss and also some fellowships to me. Thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to take your questions.